thank you so much for today. We thank you so much for being able to worship you in this place. We welcome you in this place. In the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
glad to see all your bright, smiling faces this morning. We're excited that school's starting, right? I mean, y'all might not be quite as excited as I am, but I'm pretty excited school's starting. <laughs> the kids might not be, but you know. So, But we are so glad that all of you are here this morning with us. Um, just a quick reminder, you know, um, Governor Edwards' mandate mask wearing again uh, for our state. So we do um, are requiring wearing of masks and also asking that everyone try to keep a distance from each other um, away from your social or your uh, household group. I'm sorry. So, um, you know, try to space yourselves a little bit so we can try to minimize the spread of this virus. And um, of course, just be praying for our, our church family to stay safe during these times and um, that we'll all stay vigilant in keeping this to bring these numbers down. Um, also, just a reminder here, we will do communion later in our service. So use this time during the service to prepare your hearts and um, for that. Um, the elements are on the back table. So if you want to grab those at any point before the end of the service, you can do that. And um, let's go ahead and pray. <laughs> Father God, I thank you so much for this beautiful day that you have given us today, Father, to worship you. Lord, I just pray that... Um, Lord, no matter what we come in here with, Father, no matter what's weighing on our hearts, weighing on our minds, Lord, that we would just be able to push that aside, Father, and just focus on you for this short little time that we have this morning together, Lord. Father, we welcome you here, Father. We thank you for your presence, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, Father, that we would allow you to do that, Lord, so that we can hear from you today and that we can uh, worship you fully, Father. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Why don't you all stand and worship with us? You know, in this song, we're going to be singing how, how worthy God is. He's worthy of every song that we sing, every breath that we take, Everything we do in our lives, he's worthy of it. And then when we get to the chorus, we're going to reflect on how holy he is, how set apart he is, how, how so high above he is. And, that, and that's good news. Because it means he knows us more than we know ourselves. He knows us a lot more than anyone else does. And he knows what we need before we even know it. So as we sing this song, let, let's reflect on those truths as we worship together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you sing holy holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show
just saying all about how worthy Jesus is. You're just saying all about how worthy he is of every breath we take, how holy he is, of how Jesus is the name above every other name. And so now we're going to declare that that's what we're going to build our foundation upon. That's what we're going to build our lives on. Every mission that we have.
It's just you and me here now. Only you and me here now. One more time. And it's just you and me here now. Only you and me here now. And Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 4 says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. You know, we just sang about being in the presence of God, and we are in his presence this morning. And when we're in the presence of God, we should focus on his goodness and just how good he is to us even in the hard times, and it doesn't seem like things are good, and it doesn't seem like things are going our way. He is faithful, and he is true, and he is just, and he is in control no matter what the situation is. And God works all things to the good of those who love him. close like no other 
I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you're faithful. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us this morning. Lord, I just pray that we would focus on your faithfulness, Lord. Lord, that we would focus on your goodness and we would praise you for that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
reminded, even with that sermon bumper of Isaiah's call in Isaiah 6, you know, where he, he calls out and God touches him in a significant way. And, and he, because he's in the presence of God, the goodness of God, just like we just sang about, his only response to the goodness of God is, Lord, here am I, send me. And that's what Nehemiah, Nehemiah was burdened. I would invite you to open up to Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah, we looked at last week, the all of chapter 1, beginning of chapter 2. Nehemiah was burdened that the walls of Israel, as Israel had been in captivity, now they're back in the promised land. Nehemiah was burdened that even though two waves of captives had returned, the walls of Jerusalem, the city of God, had yet to be rebuilt. Walls in that time signified something different than they do today. Walls were really about keeping people out in, in nowadays and security. Walls in that day had a similar thing, but they also represented might. They represented glory. They represented power. They represented fame. And Jerusalem in the Old Testament represented the glory of God. And so for Israel's walls to be torn down and, and, and dismantled, didn't, didn't represent their God, Yahweh, well. And so Nehemiah is, is burdened, and he asks King Artaxerxes if he can return. Artaxerxes in chapter 2 grants that he returns. And in the end of chapter 2, Nehemiah returns to the promised land, and he starts to inspect the wall. And he gets a little opposition, but he, he kind of he moves past the opposition, inspects the wall. And then here in Nehemiah 3, you'll see Nehemiah gets to work, and that's the title of our message today is The Work, uh, because we all know, just as Nehemiah, we have, a good, we have a good and great and sometimes can seem to us insurmountable work in front of us, but what we'll see today is together we can accomplish that work for the glory of God. Nehemiah chapter 3. If you look at chapter 3, there's a lot of weird names in chapter 3. This may be one of the most interesting sermons that I've ever preached, but just follow along with me, and there's going to be a big idea woven into all this. So read with me in Nehemiah chapter 3, and we're going to read all 32 verses this morning. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. You're going to see some funny names, but each of the gates sort of represented what the commerce or what the purpose of that gate was. The sheep gate was probably near the temple. It was probably near market where the sheep were brought in for sacrifice and slaughter. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated as far as the tower of the hundred, as far as the tower of Henanel. Verse 2. And next to him, the man of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakor, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. Maybe there was a fish market near there. And they laid its beams, set its doors, its bolts, its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakas. It's Some of these names, it sounds like you're hacking, but that, that was their name. And next to him, Meshalom, the son of Barakai, the son of Meshizabel. And so, hey, I know when you're reading the Old Testament, sometimes you're like, wow, I don't know how to pronounce that name. Here's the truth. I have a seminary degree. I don't know how to pronounce the names. You just kind of say it, and if you say it in enough confidence, people believe it. That's just a, it letting you in, letting you in on it. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the Te Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. And, and, and point out that that's the only place where someone's uh, mentioned in a bad light here in the passage, that the Tokoites didn't want to help out. Joada, the son of Pesah, the, and Meshalem, the son of Bethsodea, repaired the gate of Yashana, and they laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, next to them repaired Malathia, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Marathonite, the men of Gibeon and Mezpah, the, sent, the seed of the governor of the province beyond the river, beyond the river meant beyond the Euphrates, beyond the promised land, Mesopotamia. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Harhiah, um, the goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hanani, one of the perfumers repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far 
as the broad gate. Next to them, Rephiah, the son of Hur, um, ruler of half of the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Haram from whatever, something like that, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Heshabaniah, repaired. And uh, if you, an M word, the son of Haram, the son of Hashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section in the Tower of the Ovens. I know it's funny, Tower of the Ovens is probably an area where it had ovens for masonry and things like that. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Mahalish, a ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. He and his daughters, even daughters, were involved in this. Hanan and his inhabitants of Zanoah repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set its doors and its bolts and its bars and repaired a thousand cubics of wall as far as the dung gate. I'm not going to comment on that one. Melchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of the district of, uh, wow, that's a word, Beth Hakaram, uh, repaired uh, the dung gate and rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars were almost there. And Shalom, the son of Kohoseth, the ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt and covered it and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. Then he built the wall, the pool of Shelah and and the, uh, of the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. And this first part, this first section you'll see is tied by and next to him or next to them. And then this next section is tied together by after him. And so after him, Nehemiah, this is not the same Nehemiah in the book. That's why the uh, Nehemiah in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, we see that this is right here is mentioned. Um, after him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, ruler of the district of Bezer, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool, as far as the house of the mighty man, likely a shrine or a, or a house uh, dedicated to the mighty man of David, we see in the Old Testament. After him, the Levites repaired, Rehum, the son of Benai. Next to him, Hashabiah, the ruler of the half of Kila, repaired uh, for his district. After him, their brothers repaired, Bavai, the son of Henadad, and ruler of half the district of Kila. Next to him, Ezra, the son of Yeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. Buttress is like a support beam or a support wall. After him, Baruch whose name mean bless. Uh, after him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimuth, hold on, I'm losing my place. The son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired the section from the door to the house of Eliashib to the house, to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priests and the men of the surrounding area. This means people from all around the area came and they contributed, uh, repaired. And after them, Benjamin and Heshab repaired opposite their house. They took ownership for the parts of the wall that were nearest to their house. And after them, Azariah, son of Mas Mas Messiah, son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. And after him, Benoi, the son of Henadad repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, repaired another buttress and to the power projecting from the upper, upper house of the house of the court of the guard. Let me stop there real quick. And in Jeremiah, Jeremiah is actually re is arrested at the, at the house, at the court of the guard for his prophecies that Israel and its rulers would be taken into captivity. So it's pretty, it's pretty ironic here. If you study Jeremiah, this is where Jeremiah was arrested, arrested for prophesying the words of God. And now God's words are coming to pass. Israel is back and they're repairing the same place that, that Jeremiah got taken down for speaking God's word. After him, verse 25, after him, Padiah, the son of Parash, verse 26, and the temple servants living in Ophel repaired to the point opposite the water gate, not the water gate that we know of, right? You know, the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower. 
as far as the wall of Ophel. Towers were used not only as watchtowers back then for security, but the north side of the wall in Jerusalem didn't have natural security from, uh, you know, that Jerusalem's on a mountain, a mountainous area. And so this part of Zion didn't have uh, 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 protection. And so there were many towers that were having to be uh, repositioned and rebuilt with the wall. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired each one opposite his own house. Notice the priests got to work, you know? It wasn't just Mike and Dean and, and Gavin and Todd being like, all right, you all do this and that. No, they were willing to work hard alongside Israel as well. Verse 29, we're almost there. And after them, Zadok, the son of Immer, repaired opposite his own house. And after him, Shemamai, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. And after him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the son of Zalaf, repaired another section. And after him, Meshalam, the son of Berechiah, repaired as far as the house of the temple of servants and merchants opposite the muster gate. Um, to the upper chamber of the corner and between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. Notice this. This is the, this is the big idea. Why did I read that crazy chapter that uh, almost got me in trouble even as I was reading it? Why did I read that? Here's the thing that we can see from this chapter. The big idea is that God's people work together. God's people work together. All those names have a purpose. When you're reading the Bible, I know sometimes you get to lists of names and it's easy to skip over them, but, each, but the lists always have a purpose. I encourage you to go and look at Jesus' genealogy that we see in the Gospels because you see that God's hand of grace was on all generations leading to the Messiah that would be our Savior. And so this list has a purpose. This list purpose is to show us that God's people work together. And it took all of God's people working together. That very last verse says that uh, in between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. Y'all know, even to this day, we have guilds. Like we have, you know, plumber, plumbing guilds, you know, electricians, things that people are, well, all of the guilds, everyone had to use their talents, what they were skilled at to bring to Jerusalem to repair the walls. You know, some of the walls are actually still being excavated because Jerusalem's a modern, sprawling city. That means that one of the only remaining portions of the wall that we know of right now is, y'all have heard of it, the Western Wall. And part of the reason we haven't found all the rest of it is because a lot of this is sitting under modern-day buildings that we just can't tear down to, to excavate. It's, it's crazy. Our seminary here in New Orleans East has, has, has teams every year that go out they were actually part, did y'all know that we recently it was like the cave of, what was it, the cave of whatever in the Dead Sea Scrolls, what they call it, the cave of, it was a scary name, look it up, but they just discovered that, that there was like some pieces of pottery and stuff, years after the Dead Sea Scrolls were, uh, were discovered, and our seminary, believe it or not, in New Orleans East, played a big part in that. Um, there's actually a museum, I'd like, I actually have, I went to seminary, I never went to the museum, there's a museum out there with artifacts that they bring home when they're doing excavations in the promised land. When we're digging over there nowadays, we find things. You know why we find things? Because they were, as scripture tells us, they were. And excavations on this wall that Nehemiah built tell us that the wall was probably, on average, about eight feet thick. Eight feet thick. Y'all, I know we've been building a wall on the southern border. Y'all have seen pictures of it. Like, our walls that, that have been put up down there aren't eight feet thick, are they? No, like to save money, we have holes in them and all this stuff. This is eight feet, eight feet thick of just material pressed together, hardened together to, to, sh to show that God's land would be safe and that God's land would be prom promising and God's land would be purposeful. Y'all, eight feet of wall is tough work. That's, that's tough work, right? The, the Farley family, y'all, uh, uh, they actually brought some leftover boxes to our house this past week, and it was 
crazy. Filled up the back of my truck with broken down boxes. And I can't even imagine y'all unpacking all those boxes. And those who helped move them in, you saw that uh, th this is a family who doesn't have a lot of a lot of stuff, but it's still a lot to move a house and a family. Can y'all imagine the work that it would take to rebuild eight feet thick of wall? Not eight feet long. Y'all, eight feet of fence would kill me. Eight feet, actually it almost did. After one of the storms, I put, a, put the blunt end of a nail into my eye and almost went blind. Like, I am not that skilled. Can you imagine the skill and the hard work it took of God, from God's people to do this work that he has called them to do. God's people work together. And y'all, us, we, we have a lot of work to do. You'll see up on the screen, y'all, we have a grand opening coming up in a little over a month. And if you haven't noticed, uh, on the street, there's a lot of signs now pointing people to the fact that we have a grand opening. Hard work is needed. Mike got out in the sun this past week. He actually had a a cowboy hat on, which is not quite common in New Orleans, so he got a lot of honks and jeers, and it was good, but he was out there this week, because uh, this week it looked like the weather was going to be a little, little worse than last week, out there putting signs up, just so that we could be prepared for, to show people and to tell people about Jesus. Y'all, our grand opening, the, the, the next step in our journey forward, just as Israel went back and they rebuilt the wall, our next step going forward is our grand opening, and God has given us a month to work hard and to prepare for it. And what I want to ask you today, and I, this isn't the end of the message, but what I want to ask you today and what I want you to focus on is this. Notice how many gates and, and parts of the wall and all this that and towers that were being repaired. It's, depending upon the translation, probably around 45. 45 different sections and walls and towers and gates. Nehemiah showed great skill as a leader because he organized. Can y'all imagine organizing 45, 40 to 45 different groups of people that were working on different, 40 different units or actually family units are mentioned here in this text. And so Nehemiah is sitting here and he's organizing all of this and God's people work together. And, and what we see is that they work hard hard together. I told you about the eight feet thick of a wall. It's hard, 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 hard work. And for our grand opening and moving forward and starting churches and all this, launching our small group this next week, which we'll hear about at the end, all of this isn't easy. If it was easy work, here's the challenge, church family, if it was easy work, someone else would be doing it. If it was easy, someone else would be doing it. If it was easy, someone else would have already done it. I always joke with church planner friends of mine because I've lived in, uh, I was born in Metairie and we still live in Metairie, so I didn't get far in life, you know? And so um, sometimes people laugh at that, nobody laughs. But um, so here's the thing, like I'm from the area, I know the area, and I still know how hard it is and I don't have the area always figured out. And I tell church planners when they come into town, like, New Orleans is like plowing concrete. Sometimes we pray for and we sing about revival. Revival means that there was a past significant movement that maybe, like, history has written about. Well, y'all know in New Orleans, sometimes, I, I'm going to tell you, in my personal prayer life, I'm not dishonoring people who've come before us because we've had great work. Uh, University City Baptist Church that was here for many years and Crossroads Community Church did great work. We've had great work in our city from sister churches all around us. But here's the thing. Sometimes I don't pray for revival. I just pray that we would vibe a little bit. Because sometimes we're treading new ground. We're not even rebuilding walls. We're building walls. And I'm saying that metaphorically. I'm not saying we build walls to people that need to hear about us. But we honor God and what he has called us to do. J. Oswald Sanders wrote in his book, old book called Spiritual Leadership, fatigue is the price of leadership. Mediocrity is the result of never getting tired. Fatigue is the price of leadership. Mediocrity is the result of never getting tired. God's people work hard together. My pastor growing up said that there were two things you need to do in life, love Jesus and work hard. I ask our boys all the time, what does it be a man, mean to be a man? And I'd ask my girl the same thing if I had a girl. But I asked my boys, 
What does it mean to be a man? They say, love Jesus and work hard. And I want them to know that from a very young age. Y'all, the Christian life is not easy work. I remember uh, Abel and Colden. I remember when I was y'all's age and my youth pastor, Rick, uh, I was hanging out with him one day like y'all were hanging out with Todd. Y'all hang out with Todd. We're driving around and we pulled up to the back of my church and someone there had a flat tire and Rick jumped out and got to work. It was actually raining outside and and I was like, do I just sit in his, you know, SUV or do I get out and help? And then I got out and helped. And y'all, I'm, I'm not a, like, I, I was an athlete back then, but I wasn't naturally gifted with just like, like the most energy in the world. I was super, super tired after all of it. And it was at that very moment that it hit me that this is what the Christian life is all about. Amen. Christian life is not about my comfort. The Christian life is about serving. The Christian life is about giving over. The Christian life is about sweating. Amen. Amen. I would ask you, that what's the last time you sweat drops of sweat for, for Jesus? Get this, he swept drops of blood, and that's because of excruciating pain and agony that he knew he would endure for us on the cross. When's the last time we just sweat H2O? Is H2O sure when it comes out? I don't know. Whatever it is. Good, Todd. Todd's a teacher. Hopefully he knows. History teacher, but hopefully he knows. So, like, here's the thing. Like, when's the last time did we sweat for Jesus? And it's going to take a lot of sweat to do what God's called us to do, church. It's going to take prayer walking. It's going to take, hey, even if your body's broken down, I get it. Y'all, y'all, uh, Miss Dale, when I first met Miss Dale, I was riding around on a scooter. Miss Dale remembers that. You know what? We all have times where we're broken down. Several of us, we have to ride chairlifts up to get here to the second floor. We're praying for God one day, one day. Elevator or bottom floor sanctuary, right? We're praying and believing together. And so, uh, and, and not praying. We know it's going to come. And so here's the thing. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Even if your body is physically broken down, your time and your duty to tell others about Jesus is not done. And so what we see here is mainly the men got to work. It's mentioned in one part that the daughters assisted. Likely in that culture, it's because that father didn't have any young men he could put to work. So the entire family owned what the family's responsibility was, and they took their part of the wall, and they gave all that they could. Anything less than everything is nothing. They laid it all down for the glory of God. And so I'd ask you this is, What's that part of the wall that God is calling you to? What part of the wall is God calling you to? Y'all, in the next month, Mike is going to help us launch a connections ministry. Y'all see kind of the greeting that happens on the way in? Well, we want someone all the way from the parking lot all the way to upstairs. We took some of the back rows back out there and we put some tables back in the back because we want to have a connect area that new people can come and find out about our church. Y'all, we need help in our connections ministry. Laura can tell you, we're looking to hire a, a kids leader. Hopefully we can bring somebody on in the coming months. And But y'all know, we're going to start a kids ministry. We need help in the kids ministry. We need help calling and checking in on people. We need help following up with people that we've met. We need all types of help. What part of the wall is God calling you to? We know that scripture says, Ecclesiastes 9, verse, beginning part of verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do it, do it with all your might. Working hard is a God-given design. It's not just something that people, certain people are good at. Hard work is not a spiritual gift. Hard work is the command of every Christian. Romans chapter 12, verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially the members of his household, he is denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. Ah. Y'all, God has called us to work and God has warned, warned us that we need to work hard. Amen. Amen. That's why in Hebrews chapter 13, the author reminds us that in verse 6, I believe it's verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. The word share is koinonia, fellowship. Do not forget, do not neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. God warns us that hard work and service is what we're called to do and that Christians are marked by that. Brings us to our next point, which is this. 
first is that God's people work hard together, and the last is this. God's people work diligently together. What does diligence mean? Diligence is in, it's, it's the devil is in the details, not the bad devil. You know what I mean? Diligence means that you work hard at everything. The definition of diligence is showing care and consciousness to one's duty. We don't just half-heartedly do our work. We do our work with excellence. We work hard at what he's called us to do. We know we're supposed to share our faith and tell people about Jesus, and we don't just haphazardly do that. No, we study God's word. We learn maybe a, a couple of verses in Romans. Anyone, Romans 10, 13, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We memorize scripture so that we can call other people to Jesus. God's people work diligently together. I was out of town with Mike this past week, and we read this chapter together. And one thing that he pointed out as we were reading this chapter together, let's look at verse 15. And Shalom, the son of Kolazath, the ruler of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. And then you see this refrain mentioned over and over and over. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. That's a stunning amount of detail to be recorded in a list like this. Why is that detail recorded? Maybe it's because not the devil's in the detail. Maybe God is in the details. Maybe God records it because the work is important. Yes, in light of salvation, we're not saved by works. But you read the book of James, and James says that we're saved so we can get to work. We're not saved by works, but those who are saved work, and they work hard. He rebuilt it. He covered it. He set its doors, its bars, and its bolts. God, God equips us for the work that he's called us to do. What are you gifted at? What are you talented at? If you're an administrator in your job, possibly you're an administrator in the church. I know we've had a couple of ladies here that say they want to help out with administration. Well, welcome to Mike Farley. He would love to put you to work, right, Mike? So it's good to see Mike. I know I haven't been able to do it well, but Mike will put you to work. We need a good administrative team for our church. We need to manage our finances well. We need to, y'all, maybe in your job, maybe you do construction well. Yes, you know what? You're getting to work. I've already joked with Jimmy Helms, who joined the church last week, and Jimmy hasn't been a Christian forever, but Jimmy likes to talk to people. Well, you know what, Jimmy? You haven't taken a spiritual gifts test, but I can already tell you, you're an evangelist. And you know what? We're going to put you to work. It's going to be good, you know? Like, join the club, Andre. Y'all be great together. You know, like, here's the thing. Like, God calls us to use our gifts for his glory. And what we see here is that the wall is such a reversal of all the horrible things that happened to Israel. It was like restoration visibly seen. Now, God is calling us to a work where we won't always see the visible results of it. But we are storing up treasures in heaven as we, as we see souls reach for Jesus, as we see souls raised up and sent out for Jesus. God has called all of us to use our gifts in light of his glory and his fame. Yes. I'd like to close with a couple of verses here. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts. When I'm thinking about the physical gifts that Israel used to rebuild the wall, I can't help but think about the spiritual things that the New Testament God has equipped us for. There's a book by Francis Chan called Forgotten God. I highly encourage you to read it if you, if, if you ever get a chance. But in that book, and we might do it as a church at some point, in that book, one of my favorite quotes that stands out is Francis Chan points out, it's not by accident that Jesus calls the Holy Spirit helper and comforter. Y'all ever notice that? He says, hey, I'm going to leave you, but the comforter is coming. The helper is coming. And Francis Chan asks the question, why would we ever need a helper or comforter if we're living our lives comfortably? Why would we need a helper or comforter if we're living our lives comfortably? God is calling us to get uncomfortable. And the way we get uncomfortable is we're empowered by his spirit and his presence. Let's, let's look. We're going to look at three different passages here real quick. And then we're going to wrap it up and come to an end. For as in one body, Romans 12, 4 through 6, for as in one body, we have many members. And the members, the members here are talking about your arms and legs and all that. As we have many body parts and, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many 
are one body in Christ. Someone's the leg, someone's the, hey, even the person that gets, that, that you don't get along with and you think they're the butt, well, the b- body needs a butt. You know what I mean? Like, all uh, the body has, uh, y'all got off track there, but the body needs everything. We've got to function well. As we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to bounce around here a little bit and then end in the beginning of verse 13, of chapter 13. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Then after that, Paul goes and he lists some of the spiritual gifts, which... If, if you don't know the spiritual gifts, I'd love to point you to some of those passages. And we come see Mike Todd or I, and we would love to lead you to a good spiritual gifts inventory. You can Google. I think Lifeway has one online. Take a test and see what. Uh, you know what? Half the time, you don't have to take a test. Just ask somebody. If you ask somebody around you, they usually see what the Spirit has empowered you to do. And so we see that the that. 18, 20 or so spiritual gifts are listed in the New Testament, prophecy and teaching, exhorting, service, leading, giving, mercy, discernment, wisdom, knowledge, miracles, healing, tongues, interpretation, faith, evangelism, speaking, serving. We see that there are many gifts listed and all the gifts in the New Testament listed are not exhaustive. Those are just the gifts that Paul's pointing out to those churches. But we're empowered with those gifts, like 1 Corinthians tells us, for the common good. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Not everybody has the same spiritual gifts. You might say, well, I'm not good at this. Well, you know what? You're good at something. If you have patience, well, then you're gifted at something that I don't have. You know what I mean? I know I'm joking, but... We need all parts of the body. I mentioned the joke about the butt. Well, sometimes the butt is the person who like who makes you do the things that you don't want to do. None of us want to go to the bathroom all the time, right? But it makes you do what you want to do. And we have to have those administrators and those leaders who force us to do what we're called to do. I know it's funny. Tim's laughing. You know, I know it's funny. But like, hey, we, we all have to have every part of the body has to function. For just as one body has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, so we are one body in Christ. If one member suffers, we all suffer together. If one member is honored, we all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. And God appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, various kinds of tongues are all apostles. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Maybe you've been in a church system before that told you you had less of the Spirit if you didn't have one of His gifts. Paul says they're all important. Let me say, it's not even Paul saying they're all important. It's the Holy Spirit that empowered Paul to write those words. They're all important. But what does he say? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. We have to desire the gifts. God's not going to gift us if we don't desire them. And I'll still show you a more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Paul expounds on that thought. And you all know 1 Corinthians 13. You've been to a wedding. Love is patient. Love is kind. You probably read that or heard that before. Well, Paul expounds on that in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly. Y'all, each part has to work. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Love is what roots all of our gifts. If you read 1 Corinthians, Corinth was in a lot of chaos. And they had forgotten that love and serving others was the purpose of their gifts. Not everybody has miraculous gifts, but those who have miraculous gifts, it's never to bring attention to you. Ah, It's to bring people to Jesus. 
This is why David Platt, anybody ever heard of David Platt? He graduated from our seminary. He was the president of the International Mission Board for a while, wrote a book called Radical. I highly, it's very radical. I highly encourage you to read it at some point. David Platt tells a story of being in a, in a, in a, in a, in a village in Nepal, uh, a village really kind of rooted in a lot of like animism and other just crazy signs and all this. And he had led many people to Jesus, their team had in that village. But then the leader of the village encouraged the people to go back to their old ways. That leader died. That leader struck down, died dead. David and some of the other leaders went and they prayed over that leader and asked by the God's power that he would come back to life. And he came back to life. Platt's never written that in a book. He's never written, oh, heaven is for real. Like, you know, I'm sorry. Like, he's never, like, done anything to, like, make money off of it or make... No, the purpose of God working miraculously in that moment was so the rest of that village would know his power Amen. and would know that the God, the Yahweh of the Bible that we follow, that Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit living in us, is the real and authentic thing. Yes. And that's our mission, right? Love God passionately. Love people personally. And that's only possible with the Spirit of God. If someone has the Holy Spirit, you know they have the Holy Spirit, right? That's why it's called fruit of the Spirit. It's not spiritual fruit. It's not a gift. Like, it's not a spiritual gift. It's spiritual fruit. Fruit is not something you get as a gift from the Holy Spirit. Fruit is something that you do because the Holy Spirit is in you. It's a love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self control Like, these are things that exude when someone has the Holy Spirit in them. And so as we're inviting people to join the family, first we're calling them to call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, verse 13, anyone who calls upon that name of the Lord shall be saved. They confess that they're sinners and that they messed it up and that Jesus did it right and he gave himself up on a cross for us and that you call upon his name, you will be saved. But the next step is this, Peter, the guy who denied Jesus. In the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes. The same comforter and helper that they said was coming. The Holy Spirit comes. Peter, the guy who denied Jesus, stands up at the end of his message as he's preaching. 3,000 people get saved. Right before that, he says, repent, be baptized, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing. Yes, yes. The Holy Spirit's good. Ah. Repent, be baptized. And since that's a work of the Holy Spirit bringing you to Jesus, yes. accept him and grow with him. Bible says this in, in Luke 11, 13, if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Yes. Matthew, it says, give good gifts to those who ask him. Luke interpreted it that the good gift was the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. So I ask you today, are you living in the power of the Holy Spirit? Mm. Are you being empowered by the Holy Spirit? In order for Family Church to accomplish all that God has called us to do, this hard work that we're called to do together, the only way it'll get done is by our reliance on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit Amen. to help us work hard, yes. to help us go back to the promised land that is a dangerous place, help us work hard and rebuild eight feet of thick wall. Ah. All that work that we have coming up, only one person can, can make it happen. Only one vessel through which he can work will make it happen, then that's us, right? God has called us to be his hands and feet. We are his imago Dei, the image of God. We mirror him. And God has said that he won't leave us alone. His spirit will help us get the work done. So let's pray. Let's, let's respond. Let's trust and let's be empowered by God today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this funny chapter in Nehemiah 3 with a bunch of funny names, God. We thank you that when we look at it, we see that it, there's unity there. There's unity, there's diversity, different people, different gifts, different parts of, or in and around Jerusalem, but one purpose and one work. And so God, as we look ahead and we look at the New Testament, we see that the Spirit is the one who empowers our work. God, I pray today that we would rely, we would ask the Holy Spirit to come, fill us, and use us and send us out and help us to accomplish the work yes. that you've called us to do. God, we respond for your glory and your fame. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Would you stand? Let's sing this song of response. If you would like to 
talk with somebody, if you'd like to pray with somebody, find me, Mike, Todd, one of our, our well, Todd doesn't have a wife yet, maybe one day, you know, so like, um, but find one of our wives, we'd love to encourage you, we'd love to, we'd love to pray with you. First off, we'd love that you would be empowered and filled by the Spirit and used by Him to go out of this place. You know, Acts chapter 4, verse, I think it's 29 or 30, just look it up says, and when they prayed, the room in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the words of God with boldness. So right after they had just gotten thrown into prison, for the first time, they had gotten thrown into prison a bunch of other times. The only way that they were able to speak the words of God with boldness is through prayer rooted in the Spirit's power. So I'd encourage all of us to do the same. Let's respond. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence
Praying for uh, the Spirit to come and fill the atmosphere, and it, it's a little thick in here. 